When considering the management of AF, it's important to remember that it's a symptom, not a disease in and of itself. Broadly speaking, AF is an irregular heartbeat or arrhythmia that can lead to serious complications, including stroke, heart failure, chronic fatigue, and other cardiac complications. The risk of AF increases with advancing age and also with other risk factors, including male sex, hypertension, underlying heart disease such as heart failure, thyroid disease, and obstructive sleep apnea. In some cases, the cause of AF is unknown. Genes have been identified that predispose to AF, but it's also possible for people with no family history of AF to develop it. AF is associated with substantial morbidity and mortality. It is the leading cardiac cause of stroke. In fact, diagnosed AF accounts for more than one in six ischemic strokes, and people with AF have three to six times higher risk for ischemic stroke. It is estimated that one-third of all strokes after age 60 are caused by AF. However, the true proportion of AF-related strokes is probably higher, considering that embolic strokes can result from subclinical AF, which is thought to be one of the most commonly underdiagnosed and undertreated risk factors for recurrent strokes. A major goal of arrhythmia management is therefore to reduce AF-related tachycardia and cardiomyopathy and to reduce or prevent emergency visits or hospitalizations. Other goals of therapy include the identification and treatment of underlying structural heart disease and other predisposing conditions, symptomatic relief, improvement in patients' functional capacity and quality of life, and the prevention of stroke and systemic thromboembolism. We'll focus on the last goal in the remainder of this video. The 2018 Atrial Fibrillation Guidelines were published in the November 2018 issue of the Canadian Journal of Cardiology and are an update to the 2016 AF Guidelines. This video will focus on the CCS algorithm, otherwise known as the CHADS-65 algorithm for oral anticoagulation therapy in AF. This algorithm depicts the key steps in the management of AF. Once AF is detected, the first step is to identify and treat precipitating factors such as underlying structural heart disease and other predisposing factors. Next is the assessment of the patient's risk of stroke and systemic thromboembolism to determine whether antithrombotic therapy is needed. The CCS has a stroke risk stratification for patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation. It's nicknamed the CHADS-65 algorithm. This algorithm borrows from the strengths of both the CHADS-2 and the CHADS-VASC scoring systems. In the first step of the CCS algorithm, patients aged 65 years or older should be started on oral anticoagulation therapy, usually a non-vitamin K oral anticoagulant, or NOAC. The CCS recommends that when OAC therapy is indicated for patients with non-valvular AF, most patients should receive dabigatran, rivaroxaban, apixaban, or adoxaban in preference to warfarin. NOACs are the preferred agents for stroke prevention in NVAF patients who merit anticoagulation. Although there was less life-threatening bleeding with NOACs than with warfarin in the randomized controlled trials, bleeding remains an important risk. The availability of specific reversal agents has the potential to mitigate the risks associated with major bleeding events, and with it, patient and physician acceptance of OAC therapy. One of the key differences between warfarin and the NOACs is the need for INR monitoring and dosage adjustment with warfarin. In contrast, while the NOACs do not require INR monitoring, they are largely eliminated via the kidneys and therefore dosage adjustments are recommended in the setting of renal dysfunction. Consult the CCS's e-guidelines site for information about recommended dose adjustments of individual NOACs based on renal function. In situations where NOAC effects must be rapidly reversed, for example in situations of acute bleeding episodes, the only antidote currently available in Canada is idorucizumab, a dabigatran-specific reversal agent. There are also other agents currently being evaluated in clinical trials. One of these is a Dexanet Alpha, which is a factor 10A reversal agent that works on apixaban, rivaroxaban, and adoxaban. Some of the older anticoagulants like anoxaparin and fondaparinux are also being evaluated. The second agent in development is siraparantag, termed the universal reversal agent, since it works on both direct thrombin inhibitors as well as factor 10A. 
The results of the reverse AD trial underpin the CCS's recommendation that idarucizumab be administered for emergency reversal of dabigatran's anticoagulant effect in patients with uncontrollable or potentially life-threatening bleeding, and in patients who require urgent surgery for which normal hemostasis is necessary. This recommendation places relatively greater value on the ability of idarucizumab to reverse coagulation parameters indicative of dabigatran's effect, its potential to decrease bleeding-related outcomes and risks of urgent surgery, and its safety and tolerability profile. It places less value on the absence of a control group in the reverse AD trial and on the cost of the drug. In acute, life-threatening bleeding situations in which standard resuscitation is anticipated to be insufficient, or in situations in which standard resuscitation has not stabilized the patient, five grams of IV idaruxizumab should be administered as soon as possible. Activated partial thromboplastin time and thrombin time may be used to qualitatively identify the presence of active dabigatran at baseline in a patient, although they are less sensitive than DTT and ECT. Nevertheless, obtaining these measures should not delay the administration of idarucizumab. In many instances of life-threatening bleeding, clinicians have to make a treatment decision on the basis of a history of dabigatran use rather than laboratory evidence. Renal function and timing of the last dose of dabigatran provide key information regarding the likely extent of remaining dabigatran effect. Urgent surgery, as defined in the reverse AD trial, is surgery that cannot be delayed beyond eight hours, amended from four hours in the initial version of the protocol. The timing of surgery should be on the basis of the clinical indication and stability of the patient. In instances in which delayed surgery is appropriate, clinicians may obtain coagulation parameters to identify patients who would be unlikely to benefit from idarucizumab. Reversing dabigatran therapy exposes patients to the thrombotic risk of their underlying disease. Oral anticoagulation should be reintroduced as soon as medically appropriate. For patients under the age of 65, consider the traditional CHADS-2 risk factors, which include prior stroke or transient ischemic attack, or hypertension, or heart failure, or diabetes. In the presence of any one of these risk factors, oral anticoagulation therapy is indicated. If a patient has none of the age or traditional CHADS-2 risk factors or vascular disease, then it is entirely appropriate to forego antithrombotic therapy. The CCS suggests no antithrombotic therapy for stroke prevention for patients less than 65 and no CHADS-2 risk factors. If a patient has none of the age or traditional CHADS-2 criteria and their sole risk factor is vascular disease, either coronary disease or peripheral arterial disease, then only antiplatelet therapy is needed with management of their coronary or arterial vascular disease as directed by the 2018 CCS and CAIC antiplatelet therapy guidelines. For patients with non-valvular AF or flutter aged less than 65 years with no CHADS-2 risk factors, the risk of stroke associated with AF is not sufficiently elevated to justify OAC therapy. For this group, treatment should be directed at the underlying coronary arterial vascular disease. Therapeutic options include ASA 81 to 100 mg daily alone, or ASA plus either clopidogrel 75 mg daily, ticagrelor 60 mg twice daily, or rivaroxaban 2.5 mg twice daily. Now that we've covered appropriate antithrombotic therapy for patients at risk of AF-related stroke, let's go back to the AF management overview. Once the patient's thromboembolic risk has been assessed and managed, the next step is to manage the arrhythmia. There are two general strategies for management of AF, rate control and rhythm control. Choice of rhythm control drug depends on the presence or absence of cardiac comorbidities. Consult the CCS's e-guidelines site for information about recommended doses of individual rate control medications. Choice of rhythm control strategy depends on the patient's history of heart failure and their systolic function. Consult the CCS's e-guidelines site for information about recommended doses of individual rhythm control medications and for a risk-benefit analysis for ablation. Let's recap the steps in the full algorithm. 
In patients with AF, the decision to use oral anticoagulation therapy for stroke prevention is based on the patient's age and the presence of traditional CHADS2 risk factors, as well as vascular disease. Patients with AF who are 65 and older should receive oral anticoagulation therapy, preferably a NOAC, instead of warfarin. Patients who are younger than 65 should be assessed for traditional CHADS2 risk factors. The presence of one or more CHADS risk factor constitutes an indication for oral anticoagulation therapy. Patients who do not meet the age or CHADS2 criteria, but who have coronary or peripheral arterial disease can be treated with antiplatelet therapy. Patients who do not meet the age or CHADS2 criteria and who do not have vascular disease are not at sufficiently elevated stroke risk to justify anticoagulant therapy. The full atrial fibrillation guidelines cover several additional topics beyond the prevention of stroke and AF, including those listed here and many more. For more information and other topics related to the management of AF, visit the CCS's eGuidelines website. The eGuidelines site allows users to quickly browse, search, and filter the CCS's most sought after guidelines. Thank you to the many volunteer experts who've contributed countless hours to atrial fibrillation guideline development and dissemination.